presented by Think Small Institute. My name is Cisa Keller, and I'm the executive leader of Early Childhood Quality Development at Think Small. And I would like to welcome you all this morning. I would like to start us off by thanking our sponsors, Think Small Institute, Health Partners, Children's Hospital of Minnesota, Little Moments Count, and Minnesota Public Radio. I also want to acknowledge our board members that are present with us this morning, Bud Hayden, Andrea Stern, and Andre Dukes. The last couple of years have been hard for everyone, wading through a global pandemic, social unrest, and a politically divided country has been difficult for even the strongest among us. We all have needed a little help these days, but imagine how hard it has been for our youngest children. The uncertainty and mounting stress in adult lives can leave young ones to experience detachment from their caregivers and sometimes to even deal with persistent trauma. Childhood trauma often involves negative reactions called traumatic stress following an overwhelming, upsetting, or frightening experience called a traumatic event that challenges a child's ability to cope. Trauma is often described as anything that is happening too fast, too early, too long, or just plain too much. And for today's young children, this has described the reality for the majority of their lives. Many of us and the families we work with are trying to keep our heads above water and may not be able to readily address the symptoms of early childhood trauma. But we are not hopeless to the impact of early childhood trauma. There are tools and strategies we can use that can help minimize these effects. Today, we have gathered a panel of experts to discuss some of the strategies we can use to help young children and their families heal from the impact of trauma. Now, before I introduce you to today's moderator, here are a few logistics. After the panel discussion, we will be taking questions from the audience. Please use the chat function throughout the morning's conversation to ask your questions, and we will do everything we can to get to all the questions during the Q&A time. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for today's discussion. Andre Dukes is the Vice President of Family and Community Impact at the Northside Achievement Zone. And as previously mentioned, he is also a Think Small board member. At NAS, Andre oversees the Early Childhood Strategy, which focuses on ensuring that NAS scholars are ready for kindergarten through a variety of supports, including access to quality early learning centers, early learning scholarships, early childhood screening, parent support and education, and advocacy. Throughout his career, he has learned a great deal about the experiences, how experiences shape children's behavior, and how strong communities and environments and supports can uh, promote healthy development and prevent harmful behavior in children. Andre holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Minnesota Graduate School of Theology and a certificate in infant and mental infant mental health and early childhood at the U, uh, University of Minnesota Center for Early Childhood Education Development. Please join me in welcoming Andre Dukes. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for what I think is a very important and timely conversation um, about how we can be more trauma responsive in our approach to uh, early childhood development with all of the things that um, our children are going to, through right now um, and everything that's just happening in our world today, um, there couldn't be a more timely uh, moment to have this conversation and to really learn um, how we can be healers. And so um, I just wanna state that when we talk about trauma, uh, we are using a brain development lens, recognizing that you know, trauma is acute stress um, as was mentioned earlier, that disrupts healthy brain development. And our response to these traumatic events can considerably mitigate or exacerbate the impact of trauma on a child's ability to function in normal and healthy ways. So today, I am delighted that we have three panelists who are going to share their perspective on this issue and help us understand how we can be healers and foster resilience in our children and in our communities. Um, and so to get us started, I'm going to um, allow them to take some time to introduce themselves and just say a little bit about the work that they do. 
So please welcome Carla Smith, Liesl Kiesel, Kiesel um, and Jamie Bonzik. And um, I think we can start with Jamie. Jamie, would you mind kicking us off with the introductions? Sure, thank you, Andre. Um, as you said, my name is Jamie Bonzik. I'm a program officer at the Greater Twin Cities United Way, and I have the opportunity to um, be supporting a project called 80 by 3. I'm going to speak more about that uh, in its entirety in a couple of minutes, so I'll just introduce myself at this time. My background includes uh, studying early childhood and social work at the undergrad levels, and then at my master's level, I studied public administration, uh, training and development, and early childhood leadership. So I've kind of always had a choose your own adventure style of helping myself to help others. But ultimately the work that I do is very personal and has always been guided by my own experiences within my own family system and really trying to figure out how, how do I heal what has happened to me so that I don't perpetuate that and, and push that onto other people. So I'm gonna pass it over to my esteemed colleague, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here. I'm Lisa Kiesel, and I'm currently the program director at Lutheran Social Service within the Families Together program. Um, I'm a new person with the LSS team and learning a lot in the process. I have, I have joined LSS following uh, over a decade of teaching within the MSW program at St. Catherine. I am now engaged in moving the teaching to the other end of the spectrum moving it to the most young um, in oversight of the LSS Therapeutic Preschool Program, um, in which we serve children primarily from um, the Frogtown and Eastside areas of St. Paul. Um, and our children are primarily um, demonstrate the impacts of trauma as Andre had described through developmental lags um, that we seek to address and equip these children for, for more success moving forward. Uh, Families Together also has a, a, a home visiting program in which we serve from prenatal to five um, to support families um, using the parent as educators model, um, seeing parents as children's first teachers and how to equip families to be as successful and caring and responsive to their children as they can be. Um, so I'm eager to participate in this panel and, and um, appreciate being here today with all of you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Jamie. I know Carla is uh, still trying to get on this morning, and so hopefully she'll be joining us soon. But why don't we um, just go into the next section? And Jamie, um, can you kick us off again and just talk about what um, the Greater Twin Cities United Way is doing in the space of trauma-informed care? Absolutely. Sarah, can I just get the slides? Yes, give me one second. I found that when I talk about what we're doing, because it's a little bit future focused, that it's helpful to have some imagery to help paint the picture um, in great spirit of uh, work that is done in innovation. We're kind of boldly going where uh, not everybody has gone before. So I've I found these images are helpful. Um, Sarah, if you can go to the next slide, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So I just want to set the stage a little bit about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and then what other um, publicly available resources are now in the space, because a lot has happened between 2019 and 2022, in addition to the things that CISA mentioned with the pandemic and social uprising. In 2019, we had an individual donor who approached the United Way and two anchor partners, which included Catholic Charities and NAS. Andre, you were, I believe, involved in this in 2019, yes. and asked, what would it take um, to address early childhood trauma using child care, knowing that it's a, a touch point for so many families, what would that look like? And so there was community centered engagement that happened at that time, really listening to those who were leading early childhood programs in the Northside Achievement Zone and educators who were working in those spaces. And, and we listened to what we heard and three strategies emerged from that that I'm going to speak about in a, in a moment. But also what happened at that same time is we engaged in a, uh, a study with Wilder who helped us to really understand some of the financial implications of not moving forward. And then it, it, Child Trends came out with a report in 2019 that stated if organizations were going to move forward with 
trauma sensitive care, that what would it look like and what would the, be the um, outcomes? And so having some really good foundational work to put behind not just a good idea, but we were actually going to do some work that had the potential of really being human centered and really uh, supporting children, family and the staff that needed to have some supports. That was also something that was being, uh, I would say, called for from within the early childhood community because the Minnesota Department of Education updated the knowledge competency framework in 2020 that was released in 2021. And it had an entire section on trauma-informed care that had never existed before. So that was a brand new uh, item in that. And so what we have now is seven different points that each uh, educator that, and administrator, we're all looking to figure out how are we going to learn the information that is in here that is aligned with the SHAMSA framework. And then in 2020 as well, we had the preschool development grants that helped the, the hubs become a pilot and also for um, some of the other supports that come through MACMA, the Minnesota Association for Children's Mental Health has a toolkit. So we're starting to see the the community respond where the educators are saying we need supports so that we can best work with children and families and for the for some publicly available um, opportunities for the knowledge base to to be there for us. In the end of 2021, I was hired to come on. We launched an advisory group. There are seven members to that advisory group that include the Minnesota Department of Education, uh, Think Small, NAS, and Catholic Charities Remain, the Masonic Center for the Developing Brain. We have a birth worker who also is a parent of two young children and first children's finance, understanding that a lot of the barriers that exist are being, how do we afford the strategies that we know are good for children, families, and staff. So really looking from a per holistic perspective on that. And then we engaged in a survey that reaffirmed those three uh, additional, or excuse me, original strategies. So if you wouldn't mind, Sarah, going to the next slide. So what we heard from community was that they wanted professional development that included not only just knowledge base, but also coaching around how to implement the strategies that they wanted to build a capacity for their senders to support families through parent navigation and, and really understanding how to navigate the systems that are often very complex, and then to recruit and retain existing early childhood educators to the field. Our model for doing this includes, um, in some cases, using publicly available uh, or materials that exist at that MACMA site, but we also needed to create new content. In the leadership development section, we know that people need to hear things 80 to, or excuse me, eight to 20 times, and there just wasn't the content at the leads and designs area at this time. And so we, as, as the United Way, invested in creating six uh, modules that will be co-developed with our leaders from our pilots or from our um, first phase sites. And additionally, they'll have a community of practice. But also the, another barrier that we know is implementation. Right? Like we can give people the best practices or promising practices and say, this is what you should be doing. And yet at this time, we don't have the supports that are available for doing that. So we offered um, nine sites of funded implementation grant to figure out how they were going to be able to pay for the professional development that they needed and also allowed them technical assistance to create three goals that will help them create sustainability over time and also um, really looking at were there policies, procedures, or environmental changes that needed to be changed in order for them to live out what they had already written in their mission, vision, or value statements. So Sarah, if we can just go to the next slide. This is kind of a, a big slide, but this is the, the last one I'm gonna talk about at this time, but really at the end of year one, what are we really hoping to do is we wanna be able to increase the capacity among centers to support their families. We want to increase the sense of community and mutual support among cohort members, knowing that working in early childhood can often be isolating and that what we're really doing is, is community healing. And then to increase knowledge, skills, and confidence around trauma sensitive care. And specifically to what Andre, what you called out earlier is how how do events and experiences impact brain development and nervous system development? And what can we do in the classroom to help co-regulate with children and also to help increase those executive functioning skills? So that's what we're trying to do here at the United Way with a cohort model is bringing people together um, to address the, the issues that they have self-identified within the early childhood community. Thanks, Jamie. And what I really love about this is that 
what you're doing is creating an ecosystem that is specifically addressing, you know, trauma and making sure that children have the supports that they need in multiple places, right? I've always talked about these healing spaces, and it sounds like that's exactly what the Greater Twin Cities United Way is trying to do and provide that necessary training and support for educators and staff as well. So I really appreciate that. Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what's happening at uh, Lutheran Social Services? Yes, and I, I think your description of the creation of healing spaces is apt in describing what LSS seeks to provide. Our therapeutic preschool and home visiting programs are not new. They're new to LSS, but they are not new to the community. This has been a, a uh, educational setting for decades, actually, in St. Paul. And I think with that is the recognition that these, these experiences and responses to trauma, although taking greater center stage now, which is terrific, um, have certainly been within the, the vision and focus of many early childhood and family workers for a long time. And I think we've seen that in the Families Together program, um, the continuing efforts to, to attune ourselves with the more we know about the brain and development and supports, um, the, more, the, the more we try and tailor our program. I think too, we've really um, come to an understanding too of just the intensity of really needing to think about two generational response in that these experiences of trauma, yes, we see the impact in kids, but the impacts are also within the family. It's, it's a family system experience. And thinking about how, how we support the whole of the child, which is the world in which they find themselves um, and not just readiness for kindergarten. How do we support families? And so with our, we have our therapeutic preschool and we try and reduce the barriers to that as much as possible by, by providing transportation um, and other supports for families. We also have a home visiting component for the families engaged in the therapeutic preschool and have taken advantage of some of that family navigator opportunities that Jamie referenced in terms of being able to bring in case management um, resource support for families to help them make those broader connections. Um, and I, I really see with our focus in Frogtown on the east side, um, I really see the recognition that community matters and, and supporting people in their place matters. And I think that's an area for growth for us as we think about our, our preschool, our families, and the broader community in what we do. Um, I think recognizing that for, for our children, um, there's a lot of hopefulness in being able to help them um, shift their, their, their communication and behavior to the development of their voice, to their empowerment, and also to have that be the empowerment of families as they speak up for what they want, what they need, and their hopes and dreams for their children. Um, so that's where we're at. It's a, it's a challenging path, and it's um, we'll talk more about the supports for educators, et cetera, but I, I do so value that the United Way is, is embracing this in terms of that this is a high investment area. We have really low ratios for, between teachers and children in our preschool because we see that, that really intensive attention and ability to be responsive um, in very unique and individuated ways as a key to what we do to help children. And so that is a huge investment. And so it's, it's terrific to feel and hear the investment of the community growing around that as we um, figure out um, and try and be innovative with how we can support those efforts, both in education, but also the real considerations of the financial um, investment in families and children um, in this important area of, of potential for change and healing. Yes, and you know when you talk about investments, Lisa, I think it really speaks to assets. And we know that the more assets families have, um, the better they're able to mitigate the effects of trauma. And so, you know, when you talk about removing barriers and, you know, having investments and taking a two generation approach and being really place based, um, those are all of the things that we're doing at the Northside Achievement Zone. And we clearly understand that when we can scale up those kinds of assets and investments and relationships, then, you know, we are really creating those spaces, those healing spaces 
that we talked about. So, you know, uh, Lutheran Social Services has been working with families for many years and you continue to do such great work. So thank you. I thought we had um, Carla on. I hope we didn't lose her. Uh, she was on via phone, Andre, um, but it does look like we've lost her again. We're continuing to work on bringing her into the conversation. Okay. Well, um, I'll just um, say a little bit about the work that um, the Northside Achievement Zone is doing um, in this space. You know, we um, are ultimately trying to end multi-generational poverty. We take a two-generation approach um, to our work. Every family has a um, family coach that is really working with them on uh, developing what we call achievement plans. Those achievement plans are simply goals that families are setting in the area of um, housing, employment, and health, and particularly mental health. But um, we also look at the education pipeline for the scholar uh, beginning prenatally through high school. And so, you know, we have a community wellness strategy, which is really about, you know, training and supporting educators to be trauma responsive and to know, you know, how to um, respond to, you know, the cues and to look at uh, behaviors as nothing that is, you know, certainly bad, but it, it sends a message that, you know, we need to respond in a certain way and really understanding what those cues mean for the scholar and being able to work with not just the scholar, but the family to make sure that that scholar can feel safe, can feel like they um, are important and that they can do, that they're competent. They can do it regardless of whatever may, they may be experiencing in their environment. And that's really how we keep children on this path towards success and you know, mitigate all of these um, impacts that trauma could have on us when we think about ACEs. Um, you know, certainly our children have a lot of ACEs early. And um, so we really need to um, continue to um, really educate ourselves on how to respond to that. So I'm going to um, go ahead and get into our questions because I know our time is so limited. But um, Lisa, why don't we go um, and start with you on this question of the concept of trauma-informed care and we know it's not new, but um, how do you think about this in your work? I think um, as, I, as I, won't I won't repeat some of what I've said already. So in terms of how we understand children and families in the midst of the adversity they experience, um, as well as the great resourcefulness that they demonstrate for us. Um, I do think in the midst of this, it is essential that we do recognize the resourcefulness and the, the real fight of a lot of our families and kids um, and recognize that and, and, and not dismiss that or see a damaged narrative around this. That people uh, have undergone a lot of adversity and I really think we need to do some questioning of not so much how people have been, how people are a perspective of brokenness or damage but really questioning what, what and why is it that our communities do so much that strain families and actually create harm for families? How do we shift that to the support for families more generally, not just to the service sector? Um, and so really recognizing how our communities more broadly can be responsive to families and understand we can play a role in reducing the adversity that, that seems to be disproportionately visited upon um, those who are low income, those who are living in oppressed conditions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but taking it back to, to our preschool level, I think something we know with the trauma-informed approach is that when you open yourself to recognizing that being responsive to that rather than trying to control it, um, that you, you open yourself to a lot of those, those feelings and challenges as well. And we really recognize the need to support our staff um, through um, sort of reflective processing of the work being able to check in and support them in what their experiences are in being helpers and carers in this work. Um, and so really needing to, to utilize those reflective processes. And again, back to investment, um, investing in our workforce to be, to stay uh, renewed and uh, awake and alive to this work um, and to, to be refreshed each day to do it. Um, and 
I think as well, the more we can provide education and stay uh, on top of the, the emerging knowledge and share that with our employees, our team, um, and to some, you know, to the degree in which it's helpful to share that information with, with our families, et cetera. So I think it just really, it's a collective, um, a collective effort of, of support, re responsiveness, and, and really questioning how can we, you know, how can we go upstream on this and sort of reduce some of the harms and adversity that is imposed upon many communities. Yes. And really teaching, you know, children how to, you know, self-regulate and, you know, giving them tools, mm -hmm. um, being kind are mm -hmm. all ways that, you know, we can, as adults, be helpful um, in some of these moments where children are feeling, you know, anxious and those kinds of things. And so um, I didn't mention earlier, but, you know, these are some of the things that we're addressing in our uh, family Academy at NAS. And if Carla was here, she would talk about how we're recognizing the power of parents and seeing them as the first and primary teacher and how they can model good self-regulation for their children. And knowing that, you know, them being engaged in their child's learning, it has, you know, a lot of um, positive benefits for, for the child as well. And so, Jamie, can you um, say a little bit about um, your perspective of um, trauma-informed care and your work? Yeah, thank you, uh, Andre. I, I think at the Greater Twin Cities United Way, we think a lot about language and something that we, in our initial conversations with child care centers, so our first cohort is nine, has been nine identified child care centers throughout North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, and St. Paul. And we started with that as a phase one because many child care centers have multiple touch points. We'll see what phase two and phase three bring. I know that people are anxious to know, like, does this include home visiting, family friend and neighbor care, family child care? Right. I will excitedly include as many uh, communities as possible as we think about creating a region over time, um, knowing that this is a resource bound uh, initiative at this time. And so really thinking about the language that we use, we were pushed by our partners to move past, you know, trauma informed care is what is used in the knowledge competency framework. Trauma sensitive care is often what is used in uh, the, the greater community and, and yet our um, cohort members were calling for healing centered engagement. And so what is healing centered engagement? I found uh, a great article called The Future of Healing, Shifting from Trauma-Informed Care to Healing-Centered Engagement, which maybe we can share out yeah, with the yeah. group. But really thinking about a, a definition that came from that that resonated me was that a healing, the healing-centered approach comes from the idea that people are not harmed in a vacuum and well-being comes from participating in transforming the root cause of the harm within institutions. And I think that speaks exactly to what you were saying, right. Lisa. And when I think about the work that I've historically done in our communities around, um, like when we talk about self-care, I think sometimes we think, oh, self-care is like taking a bubble bath or uh, eating chocolate, something that is independent. But ultimately, advocacy is a form of emotional self-care. And really what is healing-centered engagement is around having some power and some choice and some voice in your own situation and really being able to say like, this isn't working for me. It's not working for my child. It's not working for my community. And whether that's teacher-centered engagement or family-centered engagement, when we're talking about a two-generation approach, we're talking about both of those uh, adults, you know, sectors and, and really thinking about what is it that we need and how do we get it? And I, when I think about teachers asking for what they needed, you know, they were able to get themselves a whole section in the knowledge competency framework. What we're working towards then is how do we help educators gain that knowledge, skill, and ability through a supportive way that doesn't ask them to do more with less, which is, I, I believe, where we are coming in with the Twin, Greater Twin Cities United Way and 80 by 3 is saying, yes, you ask for this information. And also, the way that we help you get that is over time, right? So we are dedicating an entire year to this first phase. And that sometimes when it when we're looking at our educators, Lisa, you've mentioned this a couple of times, but we're really looking at sometimes a, a workforce, myself included, that we're drawn to the work because of personal experiences that, that we have to work on. And so that does start to tie in the wages and the benefits and the uh, organizational culture and how do we create a, a sense of belonging? Because when we think about healing, 
that often is centered around healthy identity and a sense of belonging. And when we look at kind of those eight social identities that create an otherness within uh, yeah. ourselves and each other, it's those yeah. eight are race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, ability, religion or spirituality, nationality, and socioeconomic status. And so what are we really looking to do is we're really looking to create a cohort of organizations that are dedicated to creating a sense of belonging for the children, the staff, and the families. And when we can get to that and everybody can have some, some agreed upon language and a shared vision on understanding child development from the perspective of healthy brain development and healthy nervous system development, and that they're adults, right? Yeah. Their adults yeah. have to have the resources when they have had experiences or events in their own lives to help under, to make sense of that and to understand there's a great book, The Body Keeps the Score. And you know what, you may move on from an experience you've had, but it stays with you and it shows up in your adult behavior. And then that impacts your ability to really create those um, solid connections with children because both trauma happens in relationship and trauma is healed in relationship. And so when I think about trauma informed or trauma sensitive care or healing centered engagement, I really am focused on the healing and what's possible for our community and designed by our community being very specifically our early educators and our families in, yeah. in one group, right? Like we are a community, we are, we are care providers who are connected through our shared love of supporting children to have healthy development. Yes. And when I think that's so important, when I think about brain development, it is about the interactions that create pathways in the brain. And whenever there is a traumatic event, we need to have five positive events to compensate for that one, to create new pathways that will not, you know, that will be more healthy and not harmful. And so when you, you know, talk about the things that, you know, um, systems need to do in order to create, you know, positive environments and, you know, create these positive experiences that speak so well to, you know, healthy brain development and what we know about how pathways are created. And so, um, you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, even parents and their role and, you know, the systems that we're building. What, um, and either of you can start on this one, what is the role of community, the larger community, um, in helping to build a trauma-informed um, system? I have so, this is Lisa, I have so many thoughts about that. And, uh, and one which may be, you know, further in left field, but, um, but I, I, I think a lot about, and I don't have, I don't have easier or simple solutions for this, but there's a part of it that thinks about how do we let community be its community? I think about mutual aid. I think about being able to cultivate the solutions from within versus the imposition of my solutions from without. And so just on that very broad, how do we support communities? How do we get out of the way of what communities can do well? How do we continue to support that, um, et cetera? I think, I think many mutual aid models um, are, are very interesting and, and things to, to consider. Um, and yet I, I also think about how as communities and how we respond that we really think about in our, the services we provide the extent to which they are truly responsive, not just to trauma, but responsive to culture, community, um, hopes and dreams and current events. And how do we, how do, we do that? We, we can get locked into evidence-based approaches, which I think are really important, but needing to understand that there are multiple pillars of evidence and how do we listen to all of those and not just those of the academy? How do we listen to to community preference? How do we make sense of, of the wisdom of time um, as well as the outcome measures? And who, does, who decides the outcome measures and how, how are we engaging our community to do that? So I think healing is, is really needs to be from, you know, not just the, the, I want, I seek healing and so I'm gonna do these things. It's like, what do you understand as healing community-wise, yeah. family-wise, parent-wise, yeah. um, provider-wise? and having a broad sense of that. And I think that's something, there's much work for us to do in that, how we understand 
that inclusion and that that sense of 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 lots of wisdom in the room, as it were, um, and and work together um, and do better at sort of crossing our boundaries and lines as organizations or community groups, et cetera, to to figure out how to share this work. Um, and this growth. So it's a broader response. I don't have lots of nutsy boltsy steps in that, but conceptually, I just really think when we think about community healing, um, there's lots of things to question and turn over and look at and engage. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And I think, you know, when I think about broader community, um, I'm really speaking about faith communities, healthcare providers, you know, and, and those, you know, more broader systems that really engage families and need to be a part of that kind of coordinated system with the same language and, yeah. you know, kind of the same um, approach as um, Jamie, you were talking about. So Jamie, do you think that there are other things that those um, institutions can do um, around this ideal of trauma, being trauma responsive and trauma informed? I do. Um, so, <laughs> so I um, took a, a brief detour in my career to spend eight years as the director of health and nutrition at Pika Head Start. And so I come to the lens that we're having this conversation, not only from a child development and educational leadership perspective, but from a social determinants of health perspective and a public health perspective. And um, I think broadly about what does it mean to have well-being, not only you know physical well-being, but emotional and spiritual and financial well-being and, and a variety of things of what does it really take to be trauma sensitive and I, I think a lot from this perspective is who is responsible for the children in a community right like oftentimes I think we really center focus on who needs to know anything about child development and child stress you know system responses and that it is limited to parents and uh maybe right. the caregivers but when we think about uh, community design, right? Like what is the city planner's responsibility to understanding like our, our children front and center when we're designing communities and how are those communities yes. reflected back in the value system of our communities when we look at health systems and I, and I can speak to the ones that I've worked with and really looking at how to um, work collaboratively and um, to support families, not only with uh, their physical health needs of their child, and which there could be many that that uh, exacerbate a trauma, right? Like if you are coming from a, a family that is food insecure or, or housing insecure, there's so many different things that impact, and I'm going to say like level up the, the complexity that it takes to heal from this. And so I really think, what is the responsibility of the community you know, I, I can speak from the lens of the Twins, Greater Twin Cities United Way and saying that we have a holistic perspective and we have multiple portfolio areas and we're having conversations around family financial stability and um, housing stability and food justice and, and different intersections on how do we really support a whole family unit and think through who needs to know what in order to, for families to really thrive and for the educators to be able to, you know, support children's um, development. When I think about people ask like, well, why did you start with uh, this particular, you know, we had to know what, so so for an example, like the, the centers that we're partnering from the Northside Child Development Center are all licensed family, or excuse me, licensed child care centers, and they're all three or four star parent aware sure. programs. But what that had spoke to us at the time was like, we, in order to really understand dysregulated uh, child development, you have to understand what child development is. So as I think about that question and what do communities need to do, I would say we really need to look at our value system around supporting healthy attachment and yes. child development and how do we provide supports for both those for families and for educators. And, and what do we know about what the expectations are for educators within child care centers? And you know, just like lastly in this space, funding. Yeah. This is you. You called yeah. it. Uh, you said something, Lisa, that didn't say expensive. But what it is is it is. When we lower ratios, which are better for kids, it costs. There's a cost to that. When we invest in professional development for our educators and or supports for our families to be able to speak a shared language, it costs money. When we fund uh, family navigators, there's a cost to that. So, I think sometimes you know. I, I think about this as an unfunded mandate. When we say like, here are the best or promising practices for educators, but we really don't provide the supports for them 
And I am always on the, the jag of early childhood leadership development. When we ask people to figure it out for themselves and we don't provide the supports, then we're getting exactly what right. we've invested in. And so I think when we think about a community is how do we create a shared language of what does this mean and how do we work collaboratively mm -hmm. in a cross-sector holistic perspective to really provide an infrastructure so like, where are we going? Man, wouldn't it be great in five years time if we could have a region, but that's what it's gonna take. It would be an all in perspective of, we're all gonna contribute the resources we have from the funders who are investing in 80 by three, that's their funding. For the educators and the leaders that have signed up to do the work, that's their time. And so what we are doing is modeling a way where everybody gives what they have. And we are collect, you know, creating, I would say like a social movement of modeling what does it look like when educators and families get what they, the supports, at least the, the beginning of supports that they really need to help children have healthy development? Yes. And, and I, I love that all in approach, right? When, you know, we can all recognize how important, especially our early childhood field is to our economy, to our communities, to the workforce, and then just how we need to really lean in and be all in on the work for the early childhood workforce and providing the resources and supports um, that are needed there. So I got so much that I wanna say about all of this, but we have Carla here and I see she's going in and out and I don't wanna lose her again. <laughs> Carla, it is so good to see you. Would you say hello? kind of introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about the work that you're doing at the Northside Achievement Zone. Oh, absolutely. I had Zoom heck this morning. Um, <laughs> I thought I was on as a participant. Um, I'm glad that you guys can see me. Um, I'm Carla Smith from the Northside Achievement Zone. I work as a parent community um, mobilization coordinator. So I coordinate and organize parents around um, parent advocacy and skill building um, and leadership in that area um, through the Education Partnership Coalition as well, uh, Voices, Influence, and Better Education Systems. And so um, we do a, a whole lot there. We have a large group of parents who are uh, rocking and ready to advocate in all kinds of different avenues. Um, and we've just we've just been learning and growing as a parent community. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and in terms of your work um, with families and with parents in general, um, you're also a facilitator in our family academy. And yes. can you you know talk just a little bit about you know what um, we're working on with parents in family academy? Okay. Yeah, you know, and Family Academy, we work on uh, parents um, learning to advocate and follow their um, their their children's uh, path through college or path pathway to college by being there at every level of their education, knowing what's going on with their reading skills, knowing what's going on with them social emotionally, and just learning how to be that support system and that partner with their parents or with their um, scholar, being their partner along the way, like just learning how to, not learning, but utilizing your skills that you already have, using your parent power skills to be able to communicate with teachers, with principals, to make sure that your child know that you have a seat at the table right there with them along the way um, on their pathway through kindergarten, through um, now we're working on something for middle and high schoolers as well, but we just parent advocacy, that parent scholar relationship along the way, like here, I'm here with you the whole long way. So parents are learning some of the things that they should have ready for their kindergartner. They're learning things that they should have ready for what middle schoolers might be going through, social, emotionally, puberty, and all of that. Um, what a third grader might be having struggles with how to communicate with them along their um, education path. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the work that um, you are doing in Family Academy is so important. And Family Academy is really a gateway to parent power, 
And that's something that, you know, you talked about in terms of the advocacy and the importance of parents having a voice and having um, a place at the table to share their ideas and their expertise. And I just love how in Family Academy, we recognize that parents have expertise. They know what their families need. They know what their children need and they're best positioned to advocate for their children. So thank you for all of that work that you are doing. I know we're running out of time and we wanna leave some time for questions, but there is one um, question that I wanna to get to that I think is very important for this conversation and that is around policy. Um, and as we know, you know, without the support of our legislators um, and our policy makers, um, it's very difficult to do the work that we do. And so what policies and changes would you recommend um, need to be made, um, particularly at this moment that we are in? And Jamie, go ahead and, and lead us off on this. Yeah, I mean, I would say we could start with looking at some tools that have already been developed. That's a, we have two equity reports in the state of Minnesota. I think both call for some similar things. I know within the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, report that was uh, released which just within the last few weeks, they had some, uh, four strategies, and I'm just going to name them out because I think they're incredibly important to this work when we think about trauma-sensitive work. So around discipline and expulsion, right? When we think about behavior tells a story and, and who gets expelled the most, thinking about resource distribution and access, right? When we're thinking about high quality programs for our children and really thinking about what is quality and what does that look like and does it is it really responsive to children's needs at the time when I think about standards indicators and policies is, are they culturally responsive you know and then when I think about workforce preparation and workforce development we have work to do like we have a good place we, we are starting from a not a deficit but when I think about what is possible and when I think about you know, trauma sensitive work being coupled with um, being culturally aware, culturally humble and culturally informed and really being able to be aware of where we come from um, with our own lens when we're educators. And what does that mean about really investing in the workforce, one from a wage perspective, two from a benefits perspective, but really from that professional development of what do you need to be able to develop a relationship with a child whose behavior does not make sense to you because their experience is so different from yours. And I think early childhood leadership development is essential because when I think about, uh, I'll just make it, I was a pain in the butt to supervise because I was an educator who had experienced trauma. Great, great for working with kids, not awards. Oh, I was complicated. And so I think about what it was like to supervise me. And then I think about what it was like for me to be a supervisor of educators who I wanted to meet them where they were. And I really struggled to have the, um, the network of other leaders who had trauma sensitive like lens into like, how do we supervise for staff and how do we really support educators who have experienced their own trauma to keep them in the field and not penalize them for a childhood that they didn't design. We, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to workforce development and really thinking about it from a trauma sensitive lens. So yeah. I will pass this to either Carla or, <laughs> or Lisa, whoever wants to take it next. No, I think you make a, a good point about like, as an educator and as a practitioner, we bring trauma as well. And this is why reflective practice is such a necessary modality in our field and something that we need to support from a policy standpoint as well. We need to create space in our early childhood systems for reflective practice and reflective supervision because as adults, we have to bring our best selves to our children if we are going to help to mitigate the effects of trauma and really support our children's health. So I just had to put that plug in. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm just going to say, and also it, that costs money. So yes. we're going to need some yes. money uh, yes. because that yes. takes time. And also I really think when we think about reflective supervision, it goes back to that leadership development, right? Do our, our have our leaders been through the kind of training that it takes mm -hmm. to be able to offer that reflective supervision in a way that is really meaningful and helps educators make sense of their experiences exactly. and developing relationships with others. So I, I, I want it. And I also would like it to be funded. And I would also like for people to understand how much time it takes to develop the leadership, I'm gonna call them chops, 
to be yeah, able yeah. to implement those kind of skills in a childcare environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, after, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna echo with that. Starting that, you know what? You fund your priorities, and so it's time to put the money where your mouth is. If you love children, if you believe in families, all that rhetoric, you fund your priorities then. And so I think holding our our decision makers to account in that. I realize there's lots of priorities in this complicated world, but I I, I have a hard time thinking of a better return on investment than that of supporting our families, empowering our families and children. Um, so just to, just to back up but what um, you guys are saying about the funding. Um, I also, I think the investment in the development of, of well-prepared um, educators and leaders, and I, I do really value um, some of the endeavors through MDE and such. Um, I, I know that, that the University of St. Thomas is, is engaging in a cohort model to have interdisciplinary training of early childhood educators between social work and early childhood folks and special ed, and really trying to, to have a little bit more of that, let's look at the social determinants aspect and, and solidly preparing and supporting students um, with funding to, to have that commitment to the work. And so I think those models are, are great to consider. Um, and I'm I'm gonna go big picture because I think this is this is foundational and and our families just should not have to fight so hard. I think we need to look at um, when we think about equity, we need to look at our true commitment to economic development, support for families, the the how do we ensure that no one needs to fall so far in order to be caught by a safety net and a safety net that sadly has lots of holes in it. So I know that is a that is a, a that is an ongoing uh, fight in our world, but I, I'm not gonna miss this opportunity to put that plug that if, if we want healthier families, communities, kids, educators, we, we do need to increase people's stability and their sense of being able to trust that they can, can maintain and thrive in our communities. For sure. Thank you, Lisa. And Carla, I know that um, you've been working uh, with parents. Um, we had a cohort of parents that went through a fellowship around data and um, focused on expulsions and suspensions. Mm -hmm. And I know we have a few questions that we want to get to, but can you just tell us a little bit about um, what parents are doing around that? Oh, yeah. So we're um, working and connecting with uh, solutions and not suspensions. We did a whole data journey, the parents did a whole data journey looking from a federal, state, city, and community-wide collected data on um, suspensions um, from grade kindergarten and on up and tried to figure out what, what the problem is. And we figured out that if we find out solutions um, instead of uh, suspensions, a lot of the things are created around some of the things that we're talking about right now, economic stability, housing, mental health, and things of that nature, and what are other solutions that we could offer and what other resources we could offer outside of uh, students getting further behind when that should be an environment that supports their education. How could we be more supportive of their education? And another thing that our parent groups called, it's called Parents in Power. Uh, we're, this year we're following NASA's three-year strategic plan on going deeper and going wider on some of the things that NAS as a whole is doing. Uh, the parent group is focusing on mental health and economic stability as well. We're working quarterly on figuring out solutions on how to break down the stigma of mental health, um, how to create environments that support people wanting to reach out because not always there's, sometimes there's still this uncomfortable feeling on talking about it on um, even knowing your feelings. So we're working on um, how to get our community to check in with each other without using big words, not big words, but words that might seem intimidating or that you might feel intimidated to share your uh, feelings with. So we're working on how to get our community to check in and how we can build skills within the community around mental health and economic stability because they, like Lisa was saying, they go both hand in hand when she was saying having people being well prepared well, parents want to be well prepared too around being trauma informed. So we're uh, working on a lot of things um, over the next four quarters or the next three quarters now on just trying to build um, a group of access and support 
um, city citywide or even just for our NAS community. So. Well, thank you. That's amazing work. And um, you all are doing amazing work. So thank you so much for your responses and your, um, your expertise that you've shared with us today. We do have a few questions um, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna um, do this. Um, Jamie, can you respond to this um, question? Um, the question is, have any of you looked at the conscious discipline model for trauma resilience training for early childhood teachers, the family resource center model from the National Family Support Network and Claire Anderson's work at Chaplin, uh, Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. And then there's a follow-up question. What is United Way's commitment to this work in regards to resources, time funding, and does it include family child care? I know that was a lot, but I hope <laughs> you got that. I can give the most abbreviated version of the answer to that. So uh, again, so we're hoping to create a region within, so our commitment is uh, we're in phase one. So we, we know that we have an, enough money to do phase one, which is to invest in these first, this first phase. Um, we, we will see where we can go uh, as resources, time, energy, money are always something that determine how successful initiative can be. We have made a five-year commitment to this work. Um, so we're, we're, we're very hopeful. Uh, when it comes down to have we looked at conscious discipline, I actually had, I personally, as an educator in an organization that didn't know what to do with the behavior, bought the Becky Bailey DVD series. Like this is a long time ago and I watched them so many times, but I had to invest my own $400. That's how much it cost at the time to be trained in conscious discipline. So I had some better tools. So I would say, yes, we have looked at some models. What we're really looking to do um, with the work of the United Way is to look at how we can embed what is already happening within our state system so that we can make things more accessible to family, friend and neighbor care networks, to family, child care and others who may see themselves as part of it. I know that there's some intersectionality happening between um, some work at um, early childhood special ed and, and home visiting, looking at how do we de-silo access to some of the information so we're speaking a shared language. So we're really trying to look systemically about what is publicly available and how do we create more supports that can be easily accessed over a variety of communities so that we're getting the most um, return on our upfront investment, right? So we're looking yeah. to what is missing in the field and, and how can we create that? So that's yeah. what I can say on, on that. Sorry if I didn't remember all those things no, that you asked okay. me. It was a lot. You did good. Thank you, Jamie. So Carla, um, this one is for you. And just in a word, is there a, a different word other than trauma that resonates better with families? Or um, with parents? Yeah, Monday night, we just had a meeting to brainstorm what that word is. But we came <laughs> up with like a... a but checking in, like, what is that? Even that, like, checking in could, I don't know if it could connect with, like, trauma, but um, we're, we're working on um, brainstorming a word for April 11th is our next meeting, and we're all coming back to the table with, what did you think of? And I'm constantly trying to think of a word. Trauma's an okay word, um, but then you have to look at um, the, the youth, like children do. Yeah. Could they, could they comprehend it? What is it? Is it mm -hmm. this big or this small? Like, do you feel safe saying that you have trauma when there is somebody who just witnessed gun violence or somebody who just, but your trauma is just being bullied at school. Your trauma is just um, not having enough to eat, not just not having enough to eat at home or not just being bullied at school, but it, it looks different in different spaces. So. How do we make it okay and make a space available for somebody who's feeling those tra traumatic feelings in the inside or going through something like, hey, yours, yours is welcome in this space too. Yours could be addressed. You're, you can be acknowledged. You can um, get the resources as well. Don't think that you're, you're, what you have is not trauma. So that's why it's so important. The conversation on being trauma informed is actually so important anyway, is because so parents could know so that uh, scholars could know and community could know that it's just not this, it's not huge for one person's personal trauma and yeah. yours is little. You get what I'm saying? 
So we're still coming up with that, what it looks like. It might not be a word. It might end up being a picture. It might end up being a phrase um, or something. It's, it, it's happening globally. So we know that. So we know that we have to make sure we come up with, and in a hurry too, for a space for children to express what it is they're going through, for families to express what it is they're going through and feel safe and secure and have resources in the community anywhere they look around. There's a resource, just like there's water. There's a resource for uh, your trauma. So right, yeah. and what I hear you saying is that there's really, um, you know, how we articulate our experiences that is important. And not everyone uses trauma, but there may be various ways that we articulate our experiences and how we've been impacted by stressful um, situations. Exactly. So, we have run out of time. I'm so sorry, but thank you all to all of the panelists. Um, and thank you to those that have submitted questions. If there are questions that we didn't get to, I'm sure CISA will find a way for us to answer those questions. Thanks, CISA. <laughs> Absolutely. I will just close us out really quickly here. I mean, seriously, wow, what a conversation um, we have had this morning. So um, thank you so much to our guests, Jamie Bonzik, Lisa Kaisel, Carla Smith, and a special thanks to our moderator, Andre Dukes. You've each provided us with, us with much food for thought and strategies about how to be trauma informed and minimizing the effects of early childhood trauma. Thank you to everyone in the audience for showing up and participating in this very important and timely discussion. And again, thank you to our sponsors, Health Partners, Children's Hospital of Minnesota, Little Moments Counts, and Minnesota Public Radio. We appreciate your feedback and encourage you to share your thoughts with us in the evaluation survey you will be receiving. Tell us what future topics you'd like to hear about or even speakers you think uh, we should be hearing from. Um, be sure to join us at our next uh, uh, Think Small event and um, for Small Talks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye.